November 3rd, 2020, the US elections. The controversial era of Donald Trump is coming to an end. The time has come to take stock. What have been the key takeaways from the administration of the 45th president of the United States of America? Dear friends, in this video, we are going to examine and analyze how Donald Trump's term as head of the United States has been. This video is neither for nor against President Donald J. Trump. No, many of you will see it and will agree with the result. Others will surely not. Many of you will think that we have left things out or that we've been too hard or equally too complimentary. But in all honesty, I think that what we're going to see is a good approximation of what the Trump administration has been beyond the marketing, scandals, and political folklore. And yes, we have probably left a lot out, but we have had to select and prioritize. So I encourage you to let us know in the comments if you think there is something missing or left out and to open a debate. That said, Dear friends, let's start with what the 45th President of the United States, Donald John Trump, always considered to be his number one priority. After all, we are talking about a president who came to the Oval Office boasting of his business management skills. So we have no choice but to start exactly there. He built the greatest economy in the history of the world and now we are very simply, we're doing it again and we're on track to have, as I said, the best year we've ever had next year. You just had the best year. It's the economy, damn it. Election campaigns are the times when politicians sell us all kinds of promises. Less taxes, more vacations, more roads, better democracy, the best education in the world better sports facilities, whatever. In that way, elections become a kind of bazaar, a Turkish souk where politicians try to win our votes with grand promises. Promises as lofty and bombastic in the run up to the election as they usually are insipid when the elected finally comes to power. That's something I'm sure, and I mean absolutely certain, that we're all used to by now. Let's just say it's part of the show. However, friends, in 2016, Donald Trump went much further. It was an ode to the imagination. You don't believe me? Well, how about I remind you? Just check it out. During the 2016 election campaign, Donald Trump really put his foot down. He said over and over again that his arrival in the Oval Office would mean that for the first time, the United States would be run professionally by an experienced businessman, something that would obviously have results. Donald Trump pledged to change the United States forever. For example, the 45th president promised that he would multiply economic growth to between 4 and 6% annually, something that he would achieve through deep tax cuts and a new trade policy. In fact, following this same line, the president also committed himself to ending the enormous trade deficit that, according to him, was a burden on the US economy. And that's not all. He also gave his word that he would manage to balance the public accounts and, even better, that his policies would make it possible to pay off the entire federal public debt, that's more than $19 trillion, in just eight years. With these changes, the American people would enjoy a prosperity never seen before. But remember, all these promises are not ours, but President Trump's. Of course, four years later, we can say that what has happened has been very different, even without the SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic. Beyond all the marketing that has been poured on Donald Trump's alleged economic miracle, perhaps we should be asking, what are the real numbers that his administration has achieved? Well, it must be said that the first years were not bad, but not particularly great either. Now, I'm sorry, but this is not an opinion. It's just the numbers. Do you want specific data? Well, let's take a look. During the first three years of the Trump administration, employment growth was lower than the second term of the Obama administration. Meanwhile, the average economic growth was higher, but very similar. Wages also grew more. That's true, but very similar slightly, just two tenths of a percent more each year. From an average of 1% during the entire Obama era to one of 1.2% during the Trump era. And on the flip side, foreign investment fell in 2019 to its lowest level since 2006. Friends, take note because this is important. This scenario, all these results were also bathed in an enormous increase in public spending and the monetary expansion policy of the Federal Reserve. Take a look at this chart, for example. Under the Trump administration, in just three budgets, public spending has skyrocketed, not counting coronavirus rescue packages, by around 20%. This represents an annual increase of more than 6%. In other words, public spending under Trump has grown three times more than the national economy. 
And of course, if you also lower your taxes, what you find is a gaping hole. And that's exactly what has happened. In spite of the economy growing by more than 2% and the nation being practically in full employment, the federal public deficit in 2016 was almost $980 billion. That's 4.5% of the GDP. And that's not all. For this year, even without the coronavirus, a deficit of almost 5% was projected. 5% with the economy growing and operating at full employment. That's crazy. So imagine where these figures would go in, I don't know, in a crisis. Well, what the heck, it's 2020 and we're already here. And you know what? The federal government is expected to close 2020 with a public deficit of over 17%. Yes, that's right, 17%. You're not mistaken and we haven't misplaced any decimal points. 17%. And this, this is what explains why the public debt has not only not been repaid, but has actually skyrocketed. <laughs> If we only look at Donald Trump's first three years at the helm of the country, public debt grew by more than $3 trillion. Yes, that's trillions with a T of dollars. If we add that to the impact of the coronavirus, by mid-2020, it had passed the $6 trillion mark. To give you an idea, this is more than the entire GDP of Japan, or practically the total of the GDPs of Germany and France combined. Reduce our $18 trillion in debt, because believe me, we're in a bubble. We have artificially low interest rates. Be careful of a bubble, because what you've seen in the past might be small potatoes compared to what happens. So be very, very careful. These, my friends, are the numbers. Of course, these are facts that have been largely camouflaged by what has been a huge marketing campaign spurred on by statements like this. We made and brought this country to the greatest point in its history. We never had an economy like we had. We never had numbers like it. We are going to have them again. Donald Trump. Well, by now, we all know Trump and his usual relationship with the truth. That said, his government did have some significant successes with its economic policy during this time. There was, for example, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that the administration pushed through and managed to pass at the end of 2017. The biggest tax reform in 30 years. Not the biggest tax cut, mind you. We are talking about a law that slightly reduced personal income tax, encouraged tax competition between states, and above all, reduced corporate income tax by establishing a kind of flat tax. In addition, and this is one of the keys, it changed the scope of this tax, which is no longer worldwide. In other words, American companies no longer have to pay in full for the profits they make, for example, in Europe, where they have obviously already paid their taxes. The fact is that these measures allowed for an increase in corporate profits and therefore boosted the strength of North American companies, their competitiveness, and their stock market value. This is one of the factors that has contributed to the good performance of the North American stock market over the last few years. Of course, what Trump forgot, as we have already seen, was to adjust public spending as well. And obviously, less taxes and more public spending, it's a combination that is not usually very advisable. In any case, this tax reform had a reasonably good impact. So this is what we have now. This is where we were in 1960. Another area where we can say that Trump has had some success has been in limiting the expansion of federal regulations. As you can see, as soon as he came to power on January 30th, 2017, President Trump signed Executive Order 13771, ordering the elimination of two existing regulations for every new regulation that was approved. And although in the end it didn't work exactly like that, it is true that during his mandate, the creation of new federal regulations has been contained. One way to look at it is to look at the number of pages of the Code of Federal Regulations that each year codifies existing federal regulations. Well, notice how during the last few years, the number of pages of this code has remained relatively stable. Of course, less regulation is often something that makes life easier for businesses, especially small businesses. And it's not that Trump has reduced the number of federal regulations, but at least they haven't continued to multiply. But it's clear that despite these achievements, there were also great failures. There is, for example, the case of the trade war 
one of the key policies of this administration. In less than three years since its launch in early 2018, Trump has almost turned global trade upside down. Suddenly, he launched into an entire trade war with China and also with allied countries, Canada, Mexico, South Korea, the European powers, etc, etc. And this has been a huge failure. Not only because it undermined their competitiveness of many US companies that now have had to pay lots of tariffs on their purchases, but also because it has not fulfilled its essential purpose to reduce the trade deficit, which in fact is at a maximum. October 6th, 2020, US trade deficit jumps to largest in 14 years in August. Reuters. And that's apart from the fact that tariffs are costing American citizens and businesses tens and tens of billions each year. To give you an idea, Trump has more than doubled the average tariff on all US exports, equivalent to one of the largest tax increases since 1940 and offsetting much of the 2017 tax reduction. Yes, President Trump doesn't usually count that, but the accounts are the accounts. And that's not the end of it. Tariffs have caused other countries to take reciprocal action so that, for example, the figures of Chinese purchases of products manufactured in the United States is now lower than before the trade war began. Many American companies are facing cumbersome bureaucracy and higher costs, while foreign investment in the United States has plummeted to its lowest level since 2006. Yep, a phenomenal success. Because by the time of the 2020 election, in the United States, there were fewer industrial jobs than when Trump came to the White House. And take note, because this is not over yet. The latest country in the spotlight is Vietnam. On October the 2nd, 2020, the Department of Commerce launched an investigation into alleged unfair competition that may result in new tariffs. And here we go again. By the way, do you know how the president is fixing many of the messes that have been created by these policies? Well, by means of subsidies. Yes, that's what I said, with subsidies. May 23rd, 2019, Trump announces new $16 billion aid package for American farmers hit in trade war, Washington Post. Friends, to all these results that we have seen so far, we should add the pressure on the Federal Reserve to devalue the dollar and increase its policy of hitting the money machine, which we already talked about in a video that I'll link for you in the description. I think the Fed is out of control. I think what they're doing is wrong. Or of the government's abysmal response to the coronavirus pandemic. In the end, in economic matters, Trump's term in office has had some high points, yes. But in general, he leaves a country much more indebted, more closed to global markets, and now, thanks to the effects of the coronavirus, with fewer jobs and many more unemployed employed than when he came to power. In this light, we can almost say that Trump has been a good example in the United States of what we would call historical Peronism. And no, I haven't gone crazy. Not yet. You have the data and the policies that have been put in place in front of you. Trump has blown up many historically basic fundamentals of the Republican Party. But friends, of course the Trump legislature has not limited itself exclusively to the economic arena. Listen up. A world of fists, flags, and steel. On the question of foreign policy, Trump's mandate has been anything but quiet. From poor relations with Western leaders, to a surprising closeness to many authoritarian leaders, or directly object dictators such as Kim Jong-un. Of course, Trump's term has broken many, many molds. But this time, we will focus exclusively on the many pros and cons of what has been perhaps the most unpredictable foreign policy in a long time. And friends, it starts positively. Because the first thing we could say is that Trump has become the first US president not to declare war since 1980, and that's definitely a good thing. But that is not, of course, his only achievement. This administration has achieved milestones as important as the Abraham Accords, a historic agreement in which the United States played an important role, and for which the United Arab Emirates has formally recognized the state of Israel. A recognition which Bahrain has since made as well, and which will probably lead to the rest of the Arab countries such as Kuwait and Saudi Arabia following the same path in the near future. We are talking about the full normalization of relations between Arab countries and Israel. 
Another strength of Trump's foreign policy has been, for example, the return to the policy of deterrence with Iran following the early 2020 execution of General Soleimani, the powerful head of the elite Quds forces. He was one of the heavyweights of Iran's theoretic regime. To Trump's credit are also the defeat of ISIS, with the execution of the leader of the caliphate, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, or his support for Taiwan. Because, my friends, this administration has been particularly close to this besieged island that we covered very recently on Visual Politic. And finally, there's the peace agreement in Afghanistan, or rather the US withdrawal, because the de facto agreement gives the Taliban back all of its influence. Of course, in this case, to be fair, it is not clear that there was actually any other possible alternative. But wait a moment, because along with all these successes, we also find great failures, and among them, the most important, without a doubt, has to be China. You see, after his arrival in the White House, Donald Trump launched a kind of cold war against the Asian giant, and so far, well, he's not winning it. The Chinese government of Xi Jinping is spreading its tentacles like never before. Africa, Central Asia, and even countries of the former Yugoslavia are examples of territories where China's influence is even more significant than that of the United States. And not only that, the modernization of the People's Liberation Army has made the entire East Asian region red hot. To make matters worse, Xi Jinping has dared to put a de facto end to the regime of freedom in Hong Kong without Washington being able to do anything about it. It's a far cry from Ronald Reagan's tear down this wall in West Berlin. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Instead, we have moved on to the most absolute inaction in the case of Hong Kong, which until now was one of the freest places on earth. Asia may seem far away to us, but think about what this means in what is already demographically and economically the most important region in the world. Friends, this inaction was partly due to the fact that all the cartridges had already been spent in the trade war. So now the free world is left with tariffs, without Hong Kong, and with a China that is more expansionist than ever. What was the name of that book that he wrote? You know? The art of the deal? Then, with respect to such delicate issues as North Korea, Ukraine, or Venezuela, the administration's achievements have been practically nil. In fact, we now know that we will have to get used to the idea of a permanently nuclear North Korea. And if we add to all of this, the strained relations with many of the historical allies, the president's trade policy, which brought the United States out of the biggest free trade agreement in history, something that Xi Jinping surely celebrated, Trump's betrayal of the Kurds, his role in feeding the confrontations with Qatar, or his inability to hold Saudi Arabia accountable for the murder of Washington Post journalist and columnist Jamal Khashoggi, what we have is a real mixture of hits and misses. On the one hand, the agreement between Israel and the Arab countries has been a historical event, and the fact that the United States is involved in fewer wars is undoubtedly good news for the United States. But on the other hand, Trump leaves us with a less open world, with a new Cold War potentially underway for which we may be underprepared, and many tyrants running around with a sense of total impunity. Those are the dark sides of his legacy. From the wall to justice and a pandemic. Well, on a national policy level, we could say many things, but I think there are three issues that stand out in their own right. Immigration, justice, and the coronavirus. As far as this healthcare reform plan goes, well, that's to say it's neither here nor there, despite all the times it's been promised. Friends, if Trump has had one obsession, it has been the border wall and reducing immigration. All immigration. <laughs> On the one hand, the wall has been a huge failure. Trump promised it both actively and passively. But four years later, there has been hardly any progress. In fact, despite all the efforts, only 480 kilometers of wall has been built, of which 420 kilometers, by the way, are not new construction, but rather repairs to existing structures. In other words, the Trump wall, the new Trump wall, after four years of promises, amounts to a 60 kilometer extension along a border of more than 3,000 kilometers. And of course, Mexico has not paid a single dollar. Of course, that hasn't been their only policy on immigration. 
since taking office. The Trump administration has taken over 400 executive actions on immigration. His obsession has even extended to H-1B visas, which are granted to high-level professionals such as mathematicians, computer scientists, and engineers. Since Trump came to power, the percentage of rejected applications has tripled. Top CEOs denounced Trump immigration policy as threat to US economy, the New York Times. We are talking about highly qualified professionals who are key to the competitiveness of American companies. And this is certainly one of the reasons why support for Biden is so high in Silicon Valley. Perhaps the only thing his administration has achieved in the area of immigration is that Mexico has stopped a good deal of the migratory flows from Central America that had made him so uncomfortable. But on the other hand, where he has reaped great triumphs has been in the area of justice. In 2018, and after a bipartisan agreement, he signed the First Step Act. A law that is, and as its name indicates, a first step towards reforming the judicial system and giving a greater role to rehabilitation and reinsertion policies. He has also succeeded in placing, thanks to the Republican majority in the Senate, three conservative judges on the Supreme Court, which presumably guarantees a conservative majority for many years. This has enormous influence on US policy. And finally, the failure. The great failure. Perhaps, my friends, the greatest failure of his entire presidential term has been the way in which this administration has dealt with the pandemic, as evidenced in recordings with Bob Woodward. Trump knew very early what we were up against, but he didn't do anything. Well, not only did he not do anything, but he tried to downplay the seriousness of it. And that, my friends, has come at a very high cost to American society. More than 235,000 deaths at the time of making this video. With barely 4% of the world population, the United States accounts for around 20% of all recorded deaths. And of of course, a huge economic crisis. Well, friends, we may have left out many things, including impeachment proceedings, but what we have selected, we believe to be the main markers of the Trump era, with its high points and its low points. What seems clear in any case is that the supposed economic miracle promoted by the president simply never existed. The time has come to ask whether so much tension, so many confrontations, and so many threats have been worthwhile. But now, it's your turn. What do you think of the Trump era so far? What do you think we have failed to comment on? Leave us your response in the comments, and let's open up a debate. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did. And don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Don't forget to check out our friends at the Reconsider Media Podcast. They provided the vocals in this episode that were not mine. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. If you want to learn more about politics and world affairs and hear some more of my lovely voice, come check out the Reconsider Podcast, where we don't do the thinking for you. Find Reconsider at www.reconsidermedia.com or on Apple or Google Play or your favorite podcatcher.